I'm not a fan of hers. And uh, I would say this, and she probably has heard that, but uh, I wish a lot of luck to Harry, because he's going to need it. Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So I am sure that you've all heard by now that Meghan Markle and Prince Harry did a bombshell tell-all interview with Oprah Winfrey about how terrible their lives were as a royal couple and how mean the press was to Meghan and how, how happy they are to be free of the confines of royal life, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to react to the interview in this video. I mean, people have already done that. What I want to do is provide a kind of Monarchy 101 crash course to help people who maybe don't know that much about the royal family understand exactly why Meghan and Harry created such a firestorm. And no, it's not just because of the woke stuff. Now, I should make it very clear, as a citizen of the Commonwealth, a conservative and an Anglophile, I am an avowed royalist, a staunch monarchist and a vehement opponent of the vile notion that Australia should someday become a republic. I find that to be a repugnant suggestion. So, admittedly, I am coming at this topic with a certain degree of bias. However, I do happen to have a somewhat better understanding of the forces at play here than, say, your average American talk show host who thinks it's effective to talk about the royal family in the same way they would discuss Kim and Kanye. See, I know many of you kind-hearted people have watched that interview, and despite all of the annoying work stuff that Meghan and Harry have espoused, you will have felt pity for Meghan Markle. I mean, look, it is undeniable that she was under pressure, and of, of course it was a big change for her. I'm sure she had depression, and I'm certainly not going to stand here and defend the press. You all know how much I hate most of the media. But what you need to understand is that Meghan Markle was willfully defying royal convention in subtle ways right from the start. Contrary to what she and Harry assert, she is not blameless. Now I'm going to split this video into two chapters. In chapter one I'll address and correct some of the claims that Meghan and Harry made in their interview. So if you are already aware of a lot of these claims and why they are false then feel free to skip to chapter two. You'll see the timestamp at the bottom of the screen there for my analysis of why Meghan Markle failed at being a royal thanks to forces she herself put in play. Here we go. My family literally cut me off financially. And I had to afford, afford security for, for us. But I've got what my mum left me. And yeah. without that, we would not have been able to do this. Line number one. Meghan and Harry claimed that Meghan was offered no help or training in how to be a royal. This is false. In 2018, it was revealed by Harper's Bazaar that Samantha Cohen, who is Meghan and Harry's former press secretary and who had been with the royals for 17 years, provided Meghan with six months of duchess training after she got engaged to Harry. Line number two. The major talking point of the interview was the charge of racism leveled at an unnamed member of the royal family who allegedly expressed concerns about what their son Archie's skin color would be when he was born. Now that claim streaked through the media and the Twitter sphere and was a terrible look for the royal family. Well, at least it would be if Meghan and Harry could keep their story straight. In the first part of the interview, Meghan stated that this alleged conversation took place while she was pregnant with Archie and that it related specifically to him. However, when Harry joined the interview and Oprah referred back to the question, Harry stated that the conversation took place right at the start of their relationship, well before Meghan was pregnant. He quoted it as a comment about what will the kids look like rather than what will Archie look like. Now, for such a key point, it's strange there were two markedly different versions of the tale, considering this glaring discrepancy and the fact that they told multiple whoppers in the interview, I'm inclined to take that allegation with a sizable grain of salt, particularly since they will not name the family member. I mean, sheesh, if you want to shape the narrative, at least be consistent with the storytelling. Lie number three. Meghan alleged that the royal family denied Archie the title of prince and the official security that goes with that because he is mixed race. So not true. It is perfectly fitting with royal convention that the son of the second child 
child of the heir to the throne, that is Prince Charles, does not get a title. There are only so many prince and princess titles that can be thrown around, and there are other members of the royal family who are not provided with taxpayer-funded security. I have put some links in the video description if you would like to read about the specifics. Line number four. Meghan asserted she had not Googled Harry before they started dating, that she had not done any research on what it meant to be a royal prior to their marriage, and that she had grown up not knowing much about the royal family. However, their biography states differently, which, while Meghan and Harry did not contribute to it, was written by people who were very much on side and very well sourced. As outlined in the biography, entitled Finding Freedom, and as reported by the Daily Mail, Friends of the Duchess have painted a different picture, revealing that she was fascinated by the royals in her youth. Nanaki Pretty, who was Meghan's maid of honour at her first wedding to Trevor Engelson, said her friend was always fascinated by the royal family. She wants to be Princess Diana 2.0. She added, She had one of Princess Diana's books, Diana, Her True Story, on her bookshelf, and even when she was with Trevor, she told me she wanted to go and stay in London for at least a month. I know she used to love the Princess Diaries films. Sounds pretty knowledgeable to me. I think the reason Meghan insisted in the interview that she didn't really know what she was getting into is because if people knew she actually did have at least some idea, then the narrative that she did nothing wrong and is simply a victim of racism falls to pieces. With that, let's move on to chapter two. I was silent. Um, were you silent or were you silenced? The latter. Megan has positioned herself as a victim of bullying and racism from the press, stating during the interview that it was all happening to her simply for breathing. It was all happening just because I was breathing. This is simply not true. Meghan Markle did not assimilate herself into the royal family, pointedly so. Remember, she was very popular with the press initially. The negative coverage came later on, and from my perspective, it was round about the time she started talking about politics. We all remember when she and Harry lectured the public on climate change and carbon footprints while flying around in private jets. Very hypocritical and not helped by the fact that photos emerged of Prince William and Catherine Middleton flying a commercial airline with their children. Meghan also very publicly took umbrage at the fact that the literary curriculum at British universities, as well as the teaching staff, were too pale, male and stale, to put it bluntly. Now that was actually the first time she became political. She backed up campaign put forward by black academics to decolonize the curriculum and promote black and female thinkers instead of white male thinkers. In other words, they would replace traditional literary icons like, say, Shakespeare and Lord Byron, who shaped the modern Western literary tradition, with nondescript authors and thinkers who would only be there because of their race and gender, rather than their merits. Now, these displays of political activism ruffled feathers because the royals are not allowed to be political. They are not allowed to voice any political partisanship or to run for public office, and they even abstain from voting. And while Prince Charles certainly has bent that rule over the years, it got particularly potent when Meghan Markle came onto the scene. Now, this was just one of the ways that Meghan made it clear early on that she had no intention of trying her best to be a royal. She was happy to repeatedly and very publicly break the apolitical convention, which is an important rule because it allows the royals to be symbols of unity, transcending politics. And the reason she did this was because when she started dating Harry and then sort of effectively joined the family, she carried with her the mentality of a Hollywood actress. Rather than transitioning to a royal mentality, she maintained the Hollywood actress way of thinking, which is simply incompatible with being a royal. Namely, because an actress is all about building one's own brand. Building a royal is about maintaining the standing and reputation of the royal brand, which you all share and represent. Meghan let slip this Hollywood mentality in the interview when she insisted that she was silenced rather than being silent. Spoken in relation to her assertion that she was told she couldn't respond to stories in the press that were untrue or unfair. 
See, when a Hollywood star gets bad press, you know, they put out a tweet, they do an interview, they get their press team to draft a response. However, while the royals will put out spot fires here and there, they know that the best way to kill a story and thus maintain the family brand is to ignore it. I mean, the news cycle is so fast it would generally die of its own accord. Meghan evidently did not understand that difference in operation and couldn't cope with it. Hence the fact she thought she was silenced. And aside from anything else, it's not true that the royal family did nothing about false stories, as Meghan asserts. According to the Daily Mail, which is one of the outlets that Meghan and Harry are not very fond of, Mail on Sunday royal correspondent Emily Andrews has said that Meghan's press team did in fact defend untrue stories, saying that this was just not right. Miss Andrews said that she interacted with a press team who defended the Sussexes to quote Miss Andrews, again and again and again told me things were wrong so didn't publish and indeed tried to stop me when true. The Daily Mail also asserted that the palace did robustly stand ground on many other stories that the couple insisted were not true, resulting in the media not running them. But it wasn't just politics. Meghan also refused to follow royal conventions on a number of subtle things. Now, this is not because she didn't know the rules. Remember, she had six months of Duchess training, despite what she and Harry said to Oprah. She simply chose not to follow them because they didn't fit with the way that she was used to doing things as a Hollywood actress, in my opinion. She did things like routinely defying the royal dress code, for example. One rule that the royals have is that they don't wear black unless it is a somber event or someone close to them has died. The thinking behind this is so that the general public, who, remember, pays for them, can see them clearly when they're out and about. Now, this would seem like a, a simple convention to follow, and yet photo after photo of Meghan emerged wearing not only black, but things like no pantyhose, or no hat when she was supposed to, or pants instead of a skirt. Lots of small but distinct breaches of protocol. And while, look, she's not the only royal to have done this, Catherine Middleton has had a few boo-boos over the years with hemlines and wedges, Meghan seemed to make it routine rather than accidental. Now. The casual observer will dismiss these things as minor, and on the surface it would certainly seem that way. I mean, it's clothes. But Meghan's defiance of these royal conventions sent a clear message to the royal family. I know your rules, but I will not follow them because I don't want to, so deal with it. Now maybe you think the rules are silly or archaic, and look, maybe that can be argued. But in this context, that doesn't matter. The British royal family is a 1,200-year-old institution. Tradition and conventions, both great and small, are the keystone of their existence, particularly in an age when the monarchy no longer has any legislative power. Hence the significance of Meghan continually defying these conventions. It was a deliberate undermining of the institution. Then there were the public displays of affection between her and Harry, you know, holding hands, etc., which is something that the royals tend to avoid, another pointed break from convention. It was all a very deliberate thumbing of her nose, I think, and in that institution that is simply not going to fly. And when it didn't fly, both with family and the public, she cried about it, claimed she was a victim of racism and left, taking Harry with her. Why? Because she's a wokey and a Hollywood actress, not a royal. She was not criticised simply for breathing, nor was she targeted for her race specifically by the press. In fact, Meghan and Harry have not provided any examples of commentary targeting Meghan specifically for her race. But remember, they would see everything through the prism of identity politics and critical race theory. She and Harry would likely argue that the very fact that Meghan was being criticised a lot was racist in itself, because of course it, it simply wouldn't happen to her if she wasn't biracial. This is ridiculous. Every member of the, of the royal family has been targeted in some way by the British tabloids. And while Meghan and Harry are definitely correct in saying that the volume of this in the past was much less thanks to a lack of social media, that's not the point. The point is that they have portrayed Meghan as unfairly targeted because of her race. Now, if you want to see a direct refutation of that, just look how Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York, was treated. In the early days, she really was brutalised just for existing. The press picked on her clothes, her mannerisms, even her weight. They nicknamed her the Duchess of Pork when she put on a lot of weight while she was pregnant and had trouble losing it, which is not only rude, but ragingly sexist. Please show me where Meghan has copped criticism even remotely close to that, based on her race or otherwise. 
Meghan put herself out there as an overtly political, convention-defying royal who, along with her husband, continually patronised the British public when it came to climate change. Of course she garnered criticism and put the press offside. It has nothing to do with being biracial. After all, in the regressive leftist swamp that is most of the media, biracial people are a protected class. In fact, Meghan actually had plenty of support in the media. The woke outlets loved her, as does all of Hollywood. I mean, she's had plenty of public figures and outlets advocating for her over the past few years. The problem she has is that she is used to being adored for her fashion choices and progressive political initiatives. I mean, look, you, you know how progressives all feel like they're on a moral crusade with the moral high ground and are therefore entitled to tell the little people how to think, which the little people should be grateful for. All of which is very much indulged in the Hollywood bubble, but not when you're a royal. Meghan simply refused to see this, so when she didn't get the coverage she felt she deserved, she cried about it and said it wasn't fair. But what did she expect? The royals are beholden to the British taxpayer, and are as such expected and obliged to behave in a certain way. Royals are certainly not obliged to lecture and patronise the very people who are funding them. Meghan Markle felt that she could walk into a 1200 year old institution as this trendy American progressive, shake things up and be lauded for it. She thought she'd be just like Anne Hathaway's character in The Princess Diaries. It speaks to her ego and sense of entitlement that she expected to be adored and was so shocked when she wasn't. She has blamed everyone except herself and Harry has just gone along with it. How very, very disappointing. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me. Mm -hmm.